He's a phenomenal fisherman. Um, you see all these wonderful flies. He's going to show us how to use them today. He has written a written book. Calls himself the old fishing hobo. No. Fantastic. No, no. Girl. You're confusing me with somebody else. Okay. That's right. All right. The grumpy old Euro trash. The grumpy old Euro trash. <laughs> oh, grumpy old Euro trash. Okay, anyway, I told you I probably couldn't do it. Yeah. Anyway, I'm um, introducing Chris. Kristen. Thank, Thank you, Chris. You. Thank, Thank you, Chris. I appreciate the, you guys inviting me over here today. First, let me start by saying that uh, my wife and I had a business downtown, the chocolate bar. You guys may have come to it. I sold it a few years ago so I could retire. I became a fishing guide. And as a fishing guide, the worst people to take out is a guy my age. <laughs> you cannot tell them anything. You know, Chris, I have 87 engineers report to me. What the hell does that have to do with the fish? <laughs> you know? and, and guiding women is wonderful because they tend to look more and learn casting. You can teach a man to cast. I'm a guy. I'm a guy. No, no. So women are way better. Young men aren't too bad, but we, we generally speaking, like to. Uh, guide and teach ladies. So, European nymphing, which is what we're going to talk about. Uh, the, uh, we're going to go over a lot of stuff, so you could, you know, kind of save some of your questions for the end, see if we can get this in here. We will get there. Okay. We will do it. I promise. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a triceratops, so you don't want me near a computer. Right? Yeah, there we go. There's a lot of ways yeah. it should work. There's, there's going to be a lot of stuff, so we'll try to answer a lot of your questions at the end. So I think one of the things was, how did I get into European nymphing? Well, I've always been a fly tire. Sold my first flies in 1963. Mm -hmm. The guy was a geek in high school, and I think it was because the owner of the shop felt very sorry for me because I was buying all this crap from him. But anyway, I've been doing a long time. So uh, when Eurofly started coming out, specifically Frenchies, um, I... Uh, I really got into it on um, getting out of contact. So European nymphing is also called tight line or contact nymphing. Joe Humphreys, who taught at Penn State University, uh, he taught fishing. He really got started in European competition. And then each country has its own method, which I haven't bothered to get into because I really don't care what the polls do or the checks do. <laughs> uh, but it's all kind of tight line nymphing. There's no indicators. We do have an indicator, it's the cider material, which we can show you, mm -hmm. so. Uh, we didn't win anything when we started. We went over there thinking we were just gonna win everything and nada. So we got some European guys to help us out. And we prefer the old school method. So we were told to try some of the flies. So the Frenchie, PMD mints, and oh my goodness, they just worked Great. So the first time I used Frenchies to show you how confident I was, I let my wife use it first. And before I got to rig my rod, I had to net three big browns <laughs> on the Oahe for her, and which she doesn't like to net fish. And so I told her one day, should I just lean my rod up against the tree? <laughs> oh, that'd be great. So, Are you going to sleep with the guy tonight? She goes, probably not. So, at any rate, I have, I'm part of member by O2 fly, and I was taking guests up in the uh, Copper Basin. And this guy had never fished before, and uh, he caught so many cutthroats on a Frenchie fishing in any way he wanted that I wanted to get into this more. So I made a commitment to give it a try. The first time I went up to the middle fork of the Boise, I spent probably three and a half hours being skunked. Then I got my regular stuff and started catching fish. But I kept thinking, you gotta be doing this wrong. So we went to the Big Smoky. You know where that is behind uh, Fairfield? If you haven't, it can be really a good spot. And I got down to the river and I just started catching fish. And you, you don't catch like just the big ones or just the little ones. You basically catch them all out of the pool. So I kept yelling at my wife, babe, I got another, I got another, and I'm sure that when she, that was saying I was number one, the finger that she was throwing in. <laughs> and then the East Fork of the Big Loss. Oh my goodness, that was just crazy how well we did in there. Uh, there were some guys fishing a hole and they didn't do anything. And 
and then I got in there and started your own infing and just cleaned out the pool. They stopped eating lunch and came back to see what I was doing. So it's just a crazy effective way to fish. And I should say that it's not necessarily for everybody. My wife, who's a good fisherman, she doesn't like it. You have to watch your cider. It's kind of like using, instead of a bobber indicator, we have this colored fly line that you can come up and see later. But it's this multicolored line, and you look at that rather than a bobber. And she didn't like that. So she, even though it's effective, she really doesn't care. So fish are really tactile feeders. As food comes down the river, they will bite it. And if it's food, they eat it. If it isn't, they spit it out. And they do this incredibly quickly. Um, and that's why if you are staying in contact with your line, you can do well. So it's, and they do it so quickly. The wrong fly in their face, they're likely to eat. The perfect fly this far away, they're not likely to chase it. Maybe if it's a huge stone fly, but typically they don't do that. Let's see if we can do it again. So let's do it. Hopefully this video will work. Can you try to start that video? Well, if you shoot, if you go to YouTube and look at Take and Spit, <laughs> these fish. Uh, yeah. We can try to pull it up. Well, if you go to YouTube, I think it's just called Taken Trout Taken Spit. So if you're using a strike indicator, right. the strike indicator will be here. The top of the water moves much faster than the bottom. So you have this lag time back there. That fish will spit it out, and your bobber will not move oh. even half an inch. Oh. So here's what you can do. The, the, the video, will that video show? I think so. We were all working last night. In a strike indicator, your nymph doesn't actually hang vertical. The currents on the top of the water move so much faster than the currents on the bottom. And that's why the trout like to hang on the bottom, because they can wait there, wait for food without expending any energy. So when you cast your nymph out, you've got your strike indicator here and your nymph back here. So it doesn't, it drags it at the wrong pace. It's not a natural float. And you don't always tell when a fish grabs your nymph. Now, when you're using a Euro rig, you can think of your cider material as a vertical strike indicator. And what happens is, because the tippets are so thin and they cut right through the water, you get a vertical presentation and you stay in contact the entire time that you're fishing. So some pe that's why some people call this contact nymphing, because you're in constant contact with your nymphs. When the trout picks it up, you'll know. If your line hesitates, if it moves, if it stops, it's because the fish has grabbed it and you should set the hook. Now, when you watch videos on how to Euro nymph, the cider always jumps, you know? <laughs> I mean, they're, they wanna show you how that works, but frequently it just hesitates for a bit. And so you can set the hook. So, okay, the important thing to remember when you're using a strike indicator, see, your nymph right. doesn't actually hang you should have these showing how the current's faster at the surface, mm -hmm. and not nearly as fast on the bottom. Mm -hmm. And this is why kind of this whole contact nymphing thing works. Mm -hmm. And you can see here, it's even going different direction mm -hmm. from where it is at the top. So again, if you're using a bobber, it's gonna not really, it's gonna give you a 
false reading and with the euro, you are down in their face and as soon as they touch it, they grab it. Okay, so how do you get started in European nymphing? This, by the way, is called a red Frenchie, which is a great fly anytime uh, mayflies are coming off. Um, it's a plant vegan pattern, works really well. So, uh, when you, how do you get started in euro nymphing? If you want, you can use just your regular fly rod. The whole idea about these euro sticks are they have a very limber tip so that it will load with just leader material and flies. Now they have really improved European nymphing rods over time. You don't need to spend tons and tons of money. You really don't need a euro rod to start, uh, but it's great to have a euro leader. The deal is you can cast much better when it's just leader material you're casting. The euro stick is much more flexible, but now when they have them, they have a much stiffer butt section, so you can land big fish, believe it or not, a whole lot easier. When the fish surges, they can't break the tip of it. It's like they're punching a pillow. They don't get anywhere. So it really works uh, incredibly well how well you can beat fish. Uh, I have here a 10 foot, 10 inch two weight. So when I got it, I went down to the Boise River to try it, and they had put salmon in the river. I was not fishing for salmon. I was screwing around trying to test the new rod. And I banged this salmon right in the head and, I think, just aggravated him, and he hit it. So I've got a 10 10 2 weight. And this thing takes off. It does two big runs, and then I land it. Oh and I mean, I didn't kill it like, you know, you can land it fast enough. It's not like I fought it for 35 minutes. I mean, you can fight them remarkably quick. So reels, eventually if you get into really into Euro, these reels that have a closed case like the Galvin that I have here uh, works really well because the leader won't get all screwed up and around. But in the winter, I have another reel set up just for streamer fishing and I just have one of my old hardy lightweights. Uh, but that'll be another thing we talk about winter fishing. So uh, lines, uh, Euro leaders, you should get one. Lines, when you're just starting, you can use what you got. If you decide, okay, I'm gonna invest in a Euro stick. Um, Portland, I think they're maybe three and a half. You can get an Orvis for probably 250. Uh, Diamondback, which I've become very enamored with. Uh, they're very versatile, which we'll talk about. They're about five and a quarter. Uh, but they're a great stick and you got a Douglas. I mean, there's lots of manufacturers yes. making them now. So if you're, for a Euro line when you're starting, let's say you've made the commitment and you want to get a Euro rod. If you don't want to invest in a Euro line at first, or you can just take, if you've got an old four weight, weight forward line, cut off 20 feet of the back section where it's level and do some nail knots because your leader is going to be about 25 feet long. So you can get these Euro leaders, that's worth getting to get started because you're gonna wanna have a long leader. We have the spider material, like this is uh, Maxima, this is Chameleon, and then this is, you, I don't know if you can see this, you can come up later and see it, it's this multicolored uh, cider material to a tippet ring. And then from the tippet ring down, I usually try to run about 40 inches, depending on the water level. Now the Boise River is so low, and then maybe you get away with 36 inches if the water is deeper. This is your, site, your stripe indicator. Instead of a bobber, you have some colored monofilament. So, you can start. So this is a micro thin leader, about 20 feet of eight to 12 pound maxima, then three, to, uh, three feet of six to eight pound amnesia, about 18 inches of cider, a tippet ring, all of a sudden you've got about a 25 foot leader. Uh, and these work very well. They're, the Maxima is really, it's this brown leader material on here. It's stiff. It, when you're first starting, you can also get away with 20 pound. And with 20 pound, you can actually kind of cast dry fly. So I use the 12 pound, and I've been on the Oahe where I'll have, uh, I have, this is rigged for two flies. I've got a tag fly and then the dropper. And I'll have an Elk Care Caddis as that first one, and I basically do hopper dropper. 
And if you want to do hopper dropper, you can dissect a ripple because you don't have any line on the water to catch currents and you can hold it out. We'll talk about how you hold the rod. You, you don't do this all day. Nobody's strong enough to do that. Mm -hmm. When you are fishing a ripple, you might do a little bit more of that because you want to kind of slice up that ripple. Uh, Christy and I were fishing the big wood and there was this kind of super fast water right here in a soft pocket where Jill was sitting. And so I launched my fly over there and that time I just held my rod up, held it off the water and I kept catching fish out of that soft pocket. It, it worked really well, but that's not what you do all the time. But again, the versatility of it. So how long should the meter be? What do you, the amnesia that you were talking about, uh -huh. what is, is that a, is that, I mean, I know Maxima is a brand, what is amnesia? Uh, amnesia is a brand of leader oh, material. You can get it in bright red, and I like it in a fluorescent green. A good rule of thumb is it should be twice the length of your rod. So if you've got a 10 foot rod, 20 foot leader, something like that. So, uh, what is a mono rig? Now, the other thing is this sport is evolving and it's changed a lot in the five years, six years, whatever that I've done it. And now guys are going to George Daniel and some of the guys on the US team are going to these 35 foot leaders that just straight 5X, which I hate. It's like using a spinning rod, <laughs> but it can be very effective. So it's okay if if you get into this and you find something that you like and it works for you, it doesn't, you know, the, the book is not written. Push the envelope, do what you want. It's your fishing experience. So fluorocarbon, it resists abrasion. It's really strong. It's very expensive and it's worth it. So up here, I've got some Portland material. So we'll talk about it, but you should always set the hook downstream and then you move your rod upstream to fight. Now, the exception of that rule is when it's really big brown and you get excited you can't do one of those and you put it in a tree. So I did that and I got this 5X Cortland which says it's 5.7 pound test. So the cider material, the multicolored stuff, I had some that was made by Rio. It wasn't the Cortland Toro that I like. And that was supposed to be like 10 pound test. So I said, well, I'm just going to have to break it. So I point my rod at it and I pull and I break the cider. I don't break the 5.7 pound test, mm -hmm. which surprised the hell out of me. I ended up climbing the tree anyway to get my flies back. But it, it is expensive, but boy, it is really strong. The other side of that coin is it makes you very uh, cavalier. Oh, I'm going to put a streamer on. I don't want to cut it back to 3X. I'll just use the 5X. I got very lucky. My biggest brown in town was a 25 inch brown on one of these little black jig streamers that I have up here that you can see. And that was on 5X ticket. And, uh, and I caught that big salmon on 5X ticket. So it is really strong stuff, but it, it is not necessarily cheap. So when you're putting these together, building the leaders, especially your connection to your rod. If you use this UV knot sense, uh, use the UV light, it smooths out those connections and you don't have a speed bump. Uh, there are, if you really go down this rabbit hole and get on the internet, you can find so many recipes for leaders. Uh, Lance Egan, who I like a lot of his stuff, his recipe is about every 45 inch you change diameters so that it tapers more. Well, every one time you do that, that's a speed bump. And so cast, I thought casting it was just miserable and said, you know, Lance, I like a lot of your stuff, but this is stupid and I'm not gonna do it. <laughs> so, but for your connection to your rod, that works really well. So a whole bunch of different knots. Do you know how to do blood knots, everybody? They are really good. You just remember to spit on them. Uh, you, you, they will, that monofilament and the fluoro will heat up and if you don't have it lubricated, it heats up and weakens it. And one of the other things to remember, oh yeah, and when you're tying a blood knot together, you do more turns 
on the lighter stuff if you're connecting, you know, light to heavy. Um, what else was I going to say about that? Uh, I'm sorry. I've never heard that you have more yeah. turns on the lighter side. Yeah, it just it seems to work better. And you're using blood knots with connecting your tighter it's material to your amnesia or your yes. retina. Yep. Okay. Any any leader knot. Instead of why not a, like a double or a triple surgeon? Um, I just think the blood knots last longer. Okay. In um, now in the leader, if I'm doing a dropper I'll, or adding a tip it, I'll do a double surgeon's knot. I've gotten away from triple surgeon's knots because I, I don't think I've had one a double one break. There is a new knot called a figure eight dropper knot, which is really good and it's really strong and it's simple to tie. Uh, so that's something you can look for. So, uh, yeah, so you want the knots that go through the guides, tip it rings, want the double surgeon in the point, long leads with the ciders, and, and use that multicolored material which you can take a look at. Um, yeah, again, and what I do if you come up here and look, especially when you're starting, hmm, one of these, if you look at here, I left the whiskers. So when you're starting, if you ladies pretty much fish dry flies, everybody, so you know, when you cast your dry fly out, your eye kind of knows about what nine feet is, so you know where to look. Sometimes it's really hard to figure out where the hell this stuff is. So if you leave these little whiskers on it, that really helps you pick it up. And then there's another trick, which I think will be the next, hopefully on the next slide. Oh, has everybody used tippet rings before? No. Okay, no, okay, so see if this video is good. One of the things that we use in European nymphing are tippet rings. Tippet rings are attached to the end of your cider material and then you add your tippet to it. And learning how to tie one on, there's a little trick that you need to know how to do. The tippet rings come to you on this old fashioned uh, snap swivel and you'll have about a dozen on the swivel and you need to make sure that you grab the last one on the swivel, put your cider material through it, do whatever knot you want to do. And with knots, the best knot is the knot that you can do consistently. There's all sorts of great knots out there, but if you can't do it consistently correct, it's not a good knot. So in this case, I'm using a Pitson knot. Some people call it a 1620. I pull it tight, wet it, and at this point, I can open the swivel The tippet ring comes off, close the swivel. But a problem that many people do is they don't do the very last tippet ring and they get tippet rings all over the place. They're so small you lose them. So what you want to do is grab the last tippet ring by where the swivel actually opens. The guy I fish with mostly did that and he had tippet rings everywhere and I just <laughs> smiled and was able to give him a real ration of trash. <laughs> so. One of the things that we use in European nymphing are tippet rings. Yeah. Tippet ring. So one thing about that um, knots, I, I'm really serious about if you do a knot correctly and it's your favorite, stick with it. A guy named Dan Bolkenkamp, who I used to fish with on the Oahe, he was a great guide. We used to just hang out together. He tells me, oh, you got to use this baby knot. It's simple, it's easy, and I tie it perfectly 80% of the time. And the other 20, I hook something decent and it just unravels. I've been using that Pitson knot or 1620, whatever you want to call it, for over 30 years, and I just know how to, I mean, I'm so good with it. So uh, if you've got one that's good, yeah, you don't, you don't really have a need to switch. It could be a problem. So what they will, the pros will tell you, and the, uh, the guys on the US scene who I follow, they always say, it came to me. 
and they want them to sink quickly to get into the fish's face. Like we were saying, presentation is more important than the pattern. The wrong fly in your face will catch fish. So you have beads in many different sizes that they'll sink. Sometimes I like to, I'll have the uh, blow torches that I like in different bead sizes so that if I'm in deep water, it gets in quicker. Now that we're in winter and the Boise River is so shallow, I have smaller bead sizes. I tie it on jig hooks and bunk some beads so they get down in a hurry. Uh, so one of the things we I meant to talk about, I thought I had a slide in here about it, is when you're first doing this and you're training your eye on what to look for, like we talked about how you know about where to look for your dry fly, even if it's teeny tiny, you've, you've trained yourself to know where nine feet is. Boy, trying to find this cider material, and if the sun's not right, so there's this stuff called BioStrike that's made by Loon, and it's biodegradable, you can save it. I think I've even re rejuvenated this with some water. So you just take this stuff out, and you make, I don't know if you can see that on my finger, but it's about the size of, size of a rice grain. You do that on the cider at the tippet ring, in the middle, and at the top of your of that colored material. And you have these little fluorescent orange things to see, especially if the sun's wrong. And you do that for a while, and then one day you think, God, I don't need it anymore. I know where to look. And, and that's a big deal, teaching your eye where to look, what to look for, and to help to pick up those subtle hesitations. Um, so here's a bunch of different flies. You've got a Frenchie at the top, kind of a, a Frenchie with a blowtorch uh, with some CVT, then a hot spot hair's ear. That's a red butt pink bead. Uh, kid came in the shop and he goes, oh, your fly is so good, I caught so many fish. I said, really, let me see it. And I, I hadn't tied it. He said, this thing's dynamite. I said, oh yeah, that's mine. I said, let me take a picture. And so it's <laughs> great. So then Butano's, it, like a butane torch. That's where it came from. Uh, the French blue, I had a Frenchman friend in town and that's his favorite. And you know, the French soccer team is Le Bleu, so I call that the French blue. Rainbow Pergagon, it is just rainbow crystal flash on a hook. And uh, on the Big Wood River two years ago, uh, I caught the biggest rainbow I think that I've ever had on the Big Wood, just over 20 inches. And I thought, what the hell is wrong with you? You hit a rainbow pergamon? <laughs> now, pergamon too, that is Spanish for pellet. And it doesn't mean like pellet head, it means like a lead pellet like you'd have in a shotgun shell. And that it sinks quickly. So that's what pergamon is. This is a, called a Spanish bullet, which has a red butt and some reflection. Um, again, a bunch of different pergamons. Of course, the famous mop flies, waltz worms. It's very simple if you're just learning to tie, my God, they're easy to tie and they're great and sexy waltz. It's just basically dubbing put on a hook. And if you want to fancy it up, you can uh, throw a little CBT collar on it. Um, those, uh, come on, Pittsburgh, Cat's Rubber Legs at the very top. If you're gonna fish the South Fork of the Boise, you need to have those. The South Fork of the Boise is loaded with stone flies. So those great big stone flies that you, you know, that hatch, that they take four years to grow that size. And I believe if I've got the term right, they go through instars, which is like a type of molting process. But there's always little ones around. And so that has been one of my most productive flies on the South Fork of the Boise. Mop flies, I don't know exactly what they imitate. The green mop could perhaps be a uh, crane fly larva, some guys will take an orange marker, hit the size of it for October caddis, chartreuse mop. Boy, your guess is as good as mine, but it's money. <laughs> so I fished uh, Silver Creek uh, with Christian Reed. He said, you want to catch a lot of fish or big fish? I said, I want to catch a lot of big fish. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, okay, then you're going to use a chartreuse mop and a San Juan worm. And, you know, <laughs> What is Silver Creek noted for? The finickiest, craziest trout in America. I want a size 23 left-handed dyslexic blueing olive, right? That's what those Browns are saying. <laughs> so my insurance guy uh, wins this, they have a governor's cup um, 
where they play golf and they fish. And I said, well, David, what fly did you use? Oh, I can't tell you, it's a secret. <laughs> and he comes in the shop and he goes, oh my God, you've got them. I said, yeah, David, we've, we've had them for a while. I think it was two years ago, that was the fly to have on the Oahe. You, you could just, they would just whack fish so well. It's good in town. Um, some people tell me, oh, that's not a real fly. I say, yeah, it's not like an egg pattern or a worm pattern, you know? And then again, just more of these uh, pink bead, red butt, that kind of a blowtorch variation, any of those variations work. So, uh, so these proven flies, uh, you can see the San Juan worm and that one, a uh, squirmy worm. I don't have a lot of confidence since for some reason, I mean, I use these other crazy flies, I don't use worms a lot. Uh, I would have got out of the truck and in the gutter, it had rained, which is unusual for Boise, and there were earthworms in the gutter. So I put on a worm, and God, I caught all kinds of nice fish in the Boise River. Uh, we do have a fella who comes in the shop all the time, and all he fishes is variations of the squirmy worm. And I have some up here I can show you, you can look at. So yeah, it's crazy. And then this is a hot spot. Hair's here over here. They're just always good. I mean, it, first of all, Hare's ear is wonderful. One time, um, we decided to get a guy, Pete Wood, to Silver Creek. And I said, okay, Pete, what is the new latest fly that you read about in Fly Fishing Magazine that we're going to be using on Silver Creek? And he goes, gold rip Hare's ear. I said, what? He goes, yeah, nobody uses it anymore. It's so old school that, you know, the fish glom to it. So you get to the next one. Um, yeah, there's... Yeah, many pure attractors don't look anything like anything in nature. <laughs> Go ahead on that one. Blowtorch, wonderful. That's one of my go-tos that I love to start with. Uh, red dart, uh, Bucano Pertagon, French blues, rainbow Pertagon, light bright. Um, and this is kind of a variation of a red dart that works really well. I, I, again, I have people that when they come in the shop, that's what they want. They have, they use it all the time. They have confidence. I think I've got six in my fly box that see very little time in the water, but blowtorches I tie throughout the season. Uh, this is a, a thread Frenchie. Boy, that is money when there are uh, small mayflies coming off. The, the South Fork of the Boise, because I don't have a boat, I don't fish there during most of the spring. I don't get there until they lower the water. So I went over there and fished a ripple when pinks were coming off. And I caught so many fish with this fly. It just works great. So you've got the thread Frenchie, Frenchie, France fly, another type of Pertagon, waltz, and sexy waltz. They work great. Gasolina, I have one up here. The Spanish mm -hmm. called it a gasolina because you know how if you put a drop of oil on the water, it shines different colors? And the material in that, if it's done right, has that different kind of sheen. Right now, some friends of mine that guide in the Boise, uh, they say that a small gasolina with a hot spot, I've got an example, is just money. Duracells, who has said Duracells, her favorite, works really good. Hot spot, here's here, can't go wrong. Quildagon, that is just a quill body with some CDC collar. Uh, in smaller sizes on the Oahe can be money and squirmy wormy. Tungsten taco egg. So, so egg patterns, like come this fall, you're gonna have, pretty soon you'll have white fish that'll be laying their eggs, browns are gonna be laying their eggs, and rainbows hang out behind eating those eggs. So this fall, if you get yourself into a pocket of white fish, either on the South Fork or in town, if you're catching a whole bunch of white fish right here, then go down here because you're going to have rainbows trying to scoop up their eggs as they're coming out. And it's protein. You know, you have to be uh, kind of, got to eat everything if you're a trout. You can't be real picky, especially in a lot of freestone streams. There are some rivers like, uh, that are tailwaters, like the San Juan in New Mexico, where there's just so much, so many midges so much dipter in that that's all they ever eat. Uh, and then of course, <laughs> mock fly, which works great. So on the, um, you're talking about the white fish feeding on egg patterns. So you're gonna be fishing, you're gonna go upstream 
where the trout are going to be. Well, the trout are going to be behind the white fish. Downstream. Downstream. Now, you know, right now, pretty soon, you're going to have some browns uh, up in Hawaii. They're already starting to fill their reds. And the rainbows will be downstream from them trying to pick up eggs. In November uh, and December, the whitefish in our river will start to spawn, and the rainbows will be hanging below them to pick it so up. So do they spawn before or after the rainbows then? The rainbows spawn in the spring. Oh, you're talking about fall. Okay. Yeah, this is this fall uh, coming yeah. up in November. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. And again, it tends to be that if you hit a pattern that you catch a lot of fish on, my dad only used a light Cahill. And he said, Chris, it's the only fly you need. I said, Dad, you only go out when those flies hurt around. <laughs> that's the only one you tie on. So the likelihood of you catching anything on something else, that, that's unfair. He was a great streamer fisherman, too. And I always thought if he came back to life, he'd slap me going, didn't you watch me catch fish on streamers? What, <laughs> what the hell's wrong with you? It took me so long to come around to it. Okay. And that, so streamers, these work great. And they work great on a Euro rod. So what we have here in the bottom, we've got some uh, white sculpt snacks. That's a prelex. This is sort of like a white beachy thing. We do black uh, jig streamers in different sizes. Up there at the top, we've got a small one, 14, a 12, you know, a 10, a 6. And you can try, everybody seems to have a different size that's their favorite, because it's like my dad's like Cahill, that's what they tie on. But black jig streamers are just murder in town. And then here are more different kinds of streamers. The sculpt snacks are wonderful uh, because they imitate sculpting. And we have a lot of sculpting in the river. Twice I have seen water snakes eating sculpting down in the Boise River. Uh, Chris Girano, who has Boise River Guides, he frequently says that he's having a bad day, doesn't catch anything, he will put on a small sculpting pattern. I have up here an example of some sculpting patterns, um, and a lot of people like them smaller, like this is called a poacher, another Lance Egan pattern. This one's a little big, I have guys that tie these on a size 14 hook. It'd probably be maybe two thirds the size of this one. And they say in the Boise and in the Oahe, it's deadly. Um, you just take that one slide, or do you have something else on your... Nope, when, with that, I'll use just one fly. And when fishing the streamers, we'll get into it, the fish will tell you what they want. Um, and the book is not written on how you fish them. So typically, if it was a jig streamer, you would cast it out. And then what you're supposed to do is, as it's coming downstream, raise it up and down. You don't just flip your rod tip and let it free fall, because when it free falls, fish will bite it and spit it out so quick. So you're actually raising and lowering. You can cast it across and let it dead drift. You can cast it across, and every six feet or so, just bump it a little bit so it looks like a small minnow that's having trouble getting back down to the bottom where safety is. And you're using the heavier, Jig streamers, which uh, luckily the hook rides up. So if you're banging the bottom with your line up a bit, uh, but that works really well. If you're fishing the Oahe in the evening, drifting a black jig streamer or a black leech, uh, after the main, if they've stopped feeding on the surface on dry flies, and this year they didn't fish much on dry flies, but that last 45 minutes, use a black leech of some sort. So. To the next one. So, why streamers? Well, this is why. That's the sculpting. And uh, they have a big head, these big fins, and typically a skinny little body, skinny little butt, and they're long. One of my neighbors sent me this picture that he and his son, they were up in Big Creek, uh, which goes into the salmon. And he said, look at this, is this an invasive species or is this huge sculpting? And I said, oh my God, a bull trout would love that. You know? <laughs> but this is why, because we have so many sculpting here. So I had this uh, friend from Florida, Alex Zapata, he's a Florida flats guy. You go with him for giant tarpon, permit, bonefish, all that stuff. Great fisherman, but never fished for trout. So before he managed to break my five-weight rod, uh, <laughs> 
I hooked, took him over to the Oahe, and I hooked him up with a hopper dropper, and he just hated it. <laughs> so he put on one of those sculp snacks, a little sculpin imitation, and if the river is going this way, he would cast it on an angle like that and just go strip, strip, strip. And he catches like, I don't know, probably 25 fish. <laughs> I said, what made you do that? He said, well, that's the way we fish for snook. I said, if my father was here, he would say, you don't do it. That's not the way you fish. So my point is that it's okay to try whatever you want because the fish will tell you, yes, that's the right way or no, no, I'm not doing that. <laughs> the other thing that I've noticed like on the Oahe Sometimes, you know, they always tell you if you read about streamers, you know, work half a mile a stream. You're never going to get to do that on the Oahe. So if you've got an area, well, I can work this area. White is a great color over there because of the crappie that come through the dam. Uh, fish white first. Then go back, put on black or fish olive or copper, but you can try different colors. The other thing is, if a fish comes out and looks at your streamer but doesn't want to kill it, you know, uh, interested but not enough, rest them for five, ten minutes and put on a different color. And lock, or maybe if you're using a real big one, use a little one and they'll come and whack it. Uh, so, and we'll talk more about versatility and rods and, and what lines and stuff to use, but this is basically why we're using streamers here because we've got a lot of these dudes. They're really cool little fish. They have a terrible swim bladder, so they tend to be on the bottom, and if they get in the current, they're crappy swimmers and can't get back, and they're easy prey. So, yeah, here we've got leeches. See how it's like four different sizes of black leech, and depending who you're with, like on that Christian Reed up at uh, Silver Creek, he likes this bottom one, which is more of a rabbit strip or squirrel strip, rather than the marabou and the other. But the sculp snacks and white olive, Crelex, white leeches, these all do well around here. Uh, yeah, and just more jig streamers. You can, I probably should have deleted that one. Mr. Computer. Can you talk about what jig means? I don't know if does everyone know what jig yeah, is. Does everybody know what jig, okay. So it's uh, a, a jig is that it has a heavy head when I was a kid on Cape Cod, you would have these lead head jigs that had, it was a lead head painted white and then white bucktail attached to it. And when you reel it in you'd, for a striped bass, you'd reel it and pull it like that and the ink would go like this. So these heavy beads, these tungsten beads, they sink and go up and down. That's the jigging motion that they talk about, which makes it a jig streamer. But the hook is different too. The hook is different. If you come up and look at these, you can see the eye sticks up kind of straight. And so it rides in water with the hook up, which means you're less likely to hook on the bottom. I mean, I can still do that <laughs> on the bottom, but typically you get less. I do know there are guys in town that like to have a jig streamer and they come off it about that far with a nymph that, ooh, the fish see the streamer, and then they eat the little one. Again, the book isn't written. We can kind of do what you want. Um, and God, if you're catching fish on it, you know, what the heck? Uh, the fish will tell you if it's right. Um, but yeah, just you can experiment different ways. You know, like my friend Alex casting downstream, cast out and across, just do a straight jig in front of you. But that's how I started doing it and catching fish in the South Fork of the Boise. And then I just started expanding doing it different ways. Do you do heaviest to lightest? Do you do like the heaviest to lightest as far as your pressure? Um, what I like to do when I'm using two nymphs is I have the heaviest on the bottom and then I have the lighter one, uh, a smaller one uh, as my dropper. But if I was going to run a something off the heavy streamer, I'd have the heavy streamer on the bottom and you could have like a hare's ear or something that would be, it would have some movement, a blowtorch. That would work pretty well. You tie it right um, off the streamer? You tie it right off the bend of the hook. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's different, so not so much for Euro nymphing, but I was very enamored by those uh, Kelly Gallup articulated streamers, if you guys know what they are. They're, they're, you have the front of the fly has one hook, 
and then you have another hook behind it. So they're great big flies. And so I had made a contribution to some conservation deal, and the guy said, okay, I'll take you and your wife out. I said, I want to throw those big streamers. And he said, you can do that, but only if you come back this far with a small size eight streamer. Mm -hmm. He said, when a big brown, say, wants to kill a white fish, if it's eight inches long, it hits it and stuns it, then it has to wait for it and grab it by the head and swallow it. So if you have that small one behind it, that's easy. He said, you're walking through the kitchen at night, there's a chocolate cake, you need a knife, a fork, a plate, or there's a chocolate chip cookie and you can nail it and your wife won't know. <laughs> and, 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 I, it, and I can't say I caught more big fish on the little streamer versus the big streamer. I just had a wonderful day catching fish on both of those streamers. So having a smaller fly behind your streamer is not a radical, as radical as it may seem. Okay. Okay, so the casting here, let's see if this video works. If you have trouble casting a fly rod because you're using your wrist too much, you'll be perfect for Euro nymphing. <laughs> if you're a great fly caster, Euro nymphing is going to ruin your casting stroke. <laughs> so you basically, you, you basically sort of lob it. And then one of the other things that, that you, they tell you to do, I mean, first, you know, I mean, you kind of plop it. Yeah. And that's okay. You, again, you don't hold the rod out like this. You can't do that all day. Put it on your hip and follow it around. And then if you need to set the hook, again, set it downstream. Um, are you waterloading? I'm sorry? Is it, are you typically with a Euro rod, are you waterloading it? Uh, you can, it, but but they're so light, they, it's not like it's kind of a it is kind of a flop. Okay. Yeah. And again, these rods are flexible enough that with just the weight of the nymphs, it'll throw it. Because okay. with a regular fly rod, if you don't have line out, that's really hard to do with just meter. Okay. Uh, yeah. So um, what's the angle of the rod that you're holding? Since you're not holding it like this, right. you're holding you, it down here. You. Uh, so what you're going to want to do, what I do, is I just sort of hold it like this, unless I have a special reason that I'm trying to hit that little pocket over there. You know, you, I just hold it kind of here. I try to have the rod parallel to the water. If I see guys like this, I go, well, what are you going to, how are you going to set the hook? Where are you going to go with it? You know, hold it lower. Mm -hmm. um, and then again, set the hook whatever downstream way you can. Because so. a lot of times you do see people holding it way up here. Yeah. Uh, oh, you do. And, and is it because they're trying to see their cider, or is it uh, too much cider? Maybe it's not in the right it's, spot. You can't. You just can't do that all day long. Yeah. You can do that on a hole or two if you specifically maybe need to see your cider. If you're having that much trouble, put some bio strike on it or change your angle. Um, but yeah, I mean, it could be they're just getting into the game because that's really hard to do mm -hmm. uh, all day long. Mm -hmm. and, and like I was saying, if, if all of this is fast water and there's a soft pocket where these ladies are, boy, yeah, absolutely. You put it in there, have all your line off the water, which you cannot do with a regular fly line, you know, because you'll get that sag. That's the other thing you'll hear people talk about, oh, you get sag from the fly line and it'll move your nymphs around. And that's one of the reasons why they're saying you should just use 35 feet of 5X because the line doesn't sag. Eh, it's too much like a spinning. And, and again, you should do it the way you like to do it. And if you start catching fish, it's like that guy who only uses squirming lines. What am I gonna tell him? He's catching more than me, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, and time on the water, just like with your regular rod, time on the water is the best cure for all of this stuff. You figure out how to do it, how deep to get it. Um, if you're ticking the bottom too much, then you can raise the cider. So depending on the depth of the water, you know, you have to maybe sometimes the cider has to be under the water six, seven inches. And then other times maybe you're holding it off the water because you're fishing a shallow run. Uh, and you just have to be flexible in, in what you're doing. So, 
there's something called a tuck cast, which I think I have a video for, but with a tuck cast, what you're trying to get to do is to cast, and instead of, if, if that's where I want to be, instead of casting so that it lands at Jill's feet, I would aim it at the top of her head and then stop the rod, and it makes the nymphs kind of drop that way. They kind of come back and will sink down straight and get into depth sooner. And that's something that when you're really into euroing, you can try to get that to where it, it drops faster. So you're not trying to like lay the nymph out? No, because then you don't want it on the water. You're, you're holding it off the water, either this way or you know some way, because you don't want the... And now people are getting into, oh no, there's certain circumstances where you grease your cider and float it, and, but that's way down the road. If you really get into a euro, you can figure out how to float the cider. Um, so you have trouble yeah. casting. No, so here's a, this tuck cast. Today I'm going to talk to you about the tuck cast. You have to be out of your the tuck cast is a very useful cast okay. where you're fishing with nymphs and you're trying to get those nymphs to sink very quickly. What the tuck cast does, when you make a cast upstream, you can actually apply a little quick lift with the rod tip that will cause those flies to kick and swing down, getting those flies to land first. So when you have a weighted fly, it allows it to sink down to the bottom quickly so we can catch more fish. To do this tuck cast, we want to make our basic cast, and imagine we're casting upstream, we're casting up from the top of a run, and we're trying to get those flies to drift down nice, uh, nice and deep uh, to try and catch those bigger fish. What we want to do is make this cast and once we stop that rod tip, apply a quick little lift, which will cause those flies to hitch. So when we're making this tuck cast, we're going to make our basic cast. Let's for, uh, just for the sake of uh, the situation, let's imagine that this is upstream here. My flies are downstream. That's at the end of that drift. I'm going to make this cast upstream, then apply a quick little lift. And that lift is going to allow those flies to kick and land in, uh, land in the water fly first. So here's that cast again. There's that little lift and the flies landed first, allowing those flies to get down a little bit quicker. And that's the tuck cast. These guys make it look, I think, easier than it is. I, I have, I gotta admit, that this has not been a super easy thing for me. When making this tuck cast, we wanna make sure that we don't apply that lift too aggressively. That'll bounce those flies actually back towards us. If I make an aggressive lift, you can see that fly landed all the way back here. It's just a subtle lift, subtle little lift of the rod tip. That helps get those flies to land out upstream and uh, hopefully that'll help you catch some more fish. So that's the deal if instead of me aiming for Jill's feet, if I aim kind of above her head and stop it abruptly, flies will come back and drop. Today I'm gonna... So, um, yeah, so again, Fun and engaging way that requires concentration, and again, it, it, I don't mind doing that. Um, I've always liked catching fish, and as long as I'm on the river, what the hell, I might as well catch fish. The guy who I fish with all the time, he's a dry fly guy, and I finally said, tell me the truth, you just like watching me catch fish, right? <laughs> and, and, and then another guy really insulted a doctor who I occasionally uh, hunt with, and uh, he said, he tells me, oh, Chris, how do you get that stink off your hands? I said, you know what that is? That's the smell of fish slime, and that's why you never smell it. And, and he hasn't really talked to me since. <laughs> so if you, if you get a chance, uh, this was actually in Slovenia. Uh, went over there for my 70th birthday. The water over there is so gin clear, and any way you throw a nymph over there, you're your own nymphing, right? You're in Europe throwing nymphs. Right? <laughs> you know, you can tell everybody, oh, I just your own nymphs over there. <laughs> Next one. So versatility. This is something that I have gotten into where I have pushed the envelope. So I go over to Hawaii. My buddy's in a hurry. I don't put my wading shoes in his car. So I get there. I have a Euro stick, no waders. It's windy as hell. That's the other thing to keep in mind. When it's windy, you will hate your own nymphing. It, it just makes it real difficult to watch the cider, the wind, the pending will move stuff around. So uh, I ran, I said, wait a minute, I've got a floating, weight forward floating line in my car. I'm just gonna put it on. 
oh my goodness, all that you can cast if you go up two line weights. So if you have a three weight, put on a five weight weight forward fly line. You got a two, go to a four, you get the idea. And you can roll cast. If you're going to fish a high mountain lake, my goodness, you can roll cast forever and you don't have to worry about the brush behind you. Um, so I had this great day. I caught fish on streamers. I caught fish under an indicator because it was so windy. Um, it, it was just the versatility of it amazed me. So then I go for still water and I'm fishing in a lake. Everybody's fishing coronamids like 14 feet deep. And they go, ah, what are you going to do with that rod? I go, well, I got a 25 foot leader, so I'm just not unlike you. I don't have to change leaders. I'll put that breakaway strike indicator on. And they're just, huh, look at that. You use one rod for everything. Because, you know, you're not casting a million miles when you're uh, still water fishing. And you can cast pretty well uh, with that rig with the weight of the uh, strike indicator on it. So that worked incredibly well. So they're all using coronamids. It's windy, it it's, has been a difficult day, and I said, I'm going back to the truck. <laughs> so I put on a chartreuse mop. <laughs> and in the like 150 yards to the dock, I catch four fish, and these guys are still skunked with their coronamids. And all I can do is smile, and I know that damn mop, it's wonderful. <laughs> and then the other thing I was gonna say is that just that you're omissing that plug in the right spot, again, isn't necessarily for everyone. So last summer, or summer before, this summer I didn't have done anything, um, I go up to Silver Creek and to fish with Christian Reed. And we're on the Purdy property, which has deep water on Silver Creek. And I've got my Sage one five weight. And he says, okay, put that in the truck. Did you bring a Euro stick with you? I said, yeah. And he said, okay, I want you to use your a floating line, go up two weights, which I had with me, on your 10 foot six, Euro stick because you're going to throw dry flies when you're in a belly boat and that extra height when you're in a belly boat just allows you to cast so much better hmm. and that worked great and he says okay then when we switch to this is one of the jigs that he likes up there I nicknamed it the magic Christian he let me bring one home and copy it if I don't sell it <laughs> in the shop and I started fishing streamers and caught fish and I then I fished more to the Euro line uh, so you, you know, that's one stick to rule them all. Uh, I'm not sure how the guys at the fly shop would say, but you only need one. So Diamondback has this 10 foot two way. And this Joe Goodspeed, he first designed for Cortland. Then he designed all of Thomas and Thomas, uh, their compact two rods, which are uh, like 900 bucks. And then he started his own company. So this 10 foot two weight uh, is just a great stick. And I tell John, you gotta try this. John, do you guys know John Walter mm -hmm. Angler? He's, yeah. he's a really nice fellow. So I tell John, and he said, okay, I'll try it. Well, John hates your how he ain't gonna do that. <laughs> and he goes up to the South Fork of the Boise and he puts a weight forward, four weight line on it. And all he does is fish dry flies. And the next day he said, oh my God, what a rod. And he placed a big order with Diamondback and we've sold a ton of those. It's, so it's remarkable how you can do many things with it. Uh, it, it from that standpoint, it's just, again, it's very versatile. Still water, rivers. Uh, when we're talking about jigging, you know, that moving up and down, that day that was so windy on the Oahe, I, where I forgot everything, there was a deep, hole next to the bank and I put on one of those jig streamers and I just jigged it up and down, just jigged it up and down and this stupid brown about 15 inches came out and hit it. And I said, you should be embarrassed. You know, you're, <laughs> supposed, you're supposed to be a brown trout. You're supposed to be selective. Mm -hmm. And you know, you, you didn't see she had a badge? I mean, what the hell? <laughs> so interesting. So, and this is where seeing the cider can take some practice. And you can see here, I, got some of that bio strike on there. Uh, that really works. And again, tying your blood knot and your cider with half inch to three quarter inch tags, those whiskers helps you see what it is you're doing. And that's really important to be able to see what you're up to. Chris, is there any reason why you're using your tying, your ciders together rather than 
using the fiber material that has its the two colors that are well you can see on this one that's fallen back in the rod um, i i just had the cider here i didn't tie any knots on this one because this one was for me so this is uh, you've got your line here's your kind of the maxima and then here's red black mm -hmm. and green and here's the picket ring so on this one i didn't tie those you use the pre-made i just use the pre-made and okay. basically those with the whiskers that's pre-made i just cut it and retie it oh, got <laughs> oh yeah 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 no no i don't i don't you're not buying two different colors no. of cider mixer okay no nope, no nope, i'm just uh and then the maxima is just that i buy that level stuff um, and they're easy to tie your own uh and you just end up with a whole bunch of material around so you, or you just buy some of the pre-made ones um, but that works really well so again it, it's the versatility that you get to do so much with this Let's try the next one. Oh, we're talking about setting the hook again here to see what i said one of the important things to remember when you're, you're on an empty is that you cast upstream and you're going to follow your nymphs down if you get a hit you want to set the hook downstream because these fish are facing upstream and you want to get the hook in or you could be like me lift your rod tip straight up and then you get your leader in the trees and you need a chainsaw to get it out it's really a drag so always remember to set the hook downstream the other thing is when you're fishing and you get to the end of the drift even if you have not had a hit, when it gets to the end, you initiate your net cast by setting the hook downstream and then casting up. Many fish will hit it as you raise. It's kind of like the old leasing ring lift for those of you who are old enough to remember that. But the nymphs, as they rise to the surface, trout will think that they're an emerging insect. And when they think they're emerging, they'll come up and whack them. So what you want to do is set the hook downstream which helps load the rod and then risk your cast upstream. That makes sense to everybody? Mm -hmm. yeah. I never did yeah. realize that about it being an emerging, because like the number of fish that you catch at the end of the drift, right. I get a lot that I never yeah. ever think about. When I was a kid, there was a guy named Jim Lizingring in Pennsylvania who popularized the idea of lifting it to the surface. Mm -hmm. And that worked. Um, there was, I think I mentioned, let me go to the next slide. Uh, the dry dropper, this again, can be very effective because you don't have any drag on the water and you can hit seams on the other side. So basically, if this was a ripple, I could do right here, see where Christine is, keep moving my way around and, and keep the line off the water. So it can be very, because dry dropper in the summer can really be effective. Uh, and the hopper floats nicely. And again, if you're using at least 12 pound maxima or even a, tr a 20, it casts that dry fly, even a decent sized dry fly, remarkably well. Is it as good as your favorite dry fly rod, your Winston, if you remember? That's called, I say that because my best friend <laughs> likes to use Winston. I keep saying he's a cult member. <laughs> but, but yes, it, it, is it as good? No. but. Hey, with one rod, you just carry an extra spool down to the water, and if it's windy, you can change, put on your other line. And when I see a guy like Christian Reed, who fishes Silver Creek, he guys for peekaboo anglers, he can get whatever the heck he wants. You know, and that's what he likes to do. It's not bad. Okay, next. So the dry drop is set up. Again, you get your leader, your ticket ring. The six inch tag, your dry fly, and the nymph underneath it. And again, this is one where you just need to make sure you can't have a size 15 dry fly and a big stone fly nymph, you know? I mean, and that's, but that works. I mean, it's pretty simple and works really well. And here we're talking about jig streamers on, it, it just has worked everywhere. This uh, black jig streamer, a guy named Pat Weiss on the U.S. team sort of thought it up. Lance Egan made it popular from Fly Fish Food, and I stole it from him. He ties it in a smaller size, and now we have customers that tie it down to 14, up much bigger than this. Um, I have brought 
large mouse, small mouse, bull trout, rainbows, brown, tiger trout down in uh, Lake in Nevada. Um, it, it's like a woolly booger on steroids. I mean, it's just, and again, I maybe I'm a little bit with my data. This is what I tie on, so that's what I'm going to catch them on, you know, but it works really well. Uh, one of the other things that you can do, well, talking about versatility, I was up the uh, South Fork of the Boise, and I was having a day where, oh my God, I could have caught them left handed. I mean, I just, everything worked. So I thought, what the heck, I'm going to put on a soft tackle pheasant tail and a soft tackle hare's ear. When I was a kid, I lived in New Mexico, we grew up in Colorado, and those high mountain streams, if you had a soft tackle, hair's ear, or pheasant tail, you just whack fish. I cast it out, I let it swing, ba boom, catch fish. Then I put on a woolly booger. I let it hang in the current, move it back and forth, catching fish. So sometimes I think we get, we have to do things so technical or modern or with it, where the fish haven't read all the crap we had, you know? <laughs> they don't know any better. And if you, again, put it in their face, uh, my buddy Tom, we're, do you guys know where the braids are? We come down Cow Creek Road, this to the South Fork of the Boise, mm -hmm. and the first parking lot, you walk over, and it's where the river had split up and it comes back together. And uh, Tom, using his dry fly, he said, oh God, I've whipped that water to a froth, don't even bother to fish there. I said, well, well here, let me just make a cast or two. And after he'd spent like an hour throwing dry flies, I walk right out and catch two fish in a row on a jig streamer. <laughs> so he just shakes his head and yeah, thinks it's kind of crazy. But at any rate, it, they're very effective in different colors and different patterns. But again, this black one, that's UV uh, chenille. And the trout kind of see with UV vision and it, it tends to pick up light underwater and they can see it a little better. That's at least that's the theory. And then lefty prey always said, if it ain't chartreuse, it ain't no use. So I <laughs> needed to differentiate sizes. So I went with chartreuse on this one. Yeah, yeah. and this was that bull trout I caught uh, on that, the first time I ever used it. And for those of you who know Eric Moncada, he and I went up there when I tied a fly on it. He said, that's stupid. And three casts, and I catch this, and he goes, give me that rod. He catches a big rainbow, and a week later, he's got a box filled with jig streamers. And I said, oh, you want to sell such a piece of junk? He, <laughs> if you get to where you have friends who are artists, you will learn to hate them when you see the flies they tie. <laughs> artists see things differently, and their sense of proportion and color and it just makes me crazy. I try so hard, and it looks okay. And then Eric, or my friend Pacho in Colombia, who's a great artist, they just tie flies, and I think, why do I bother, you know? <laughs> so. so this is the George Daniel uh, streamer leader, and I like to do this in the winter. That's what I have on this one rod here. I have about five feet of 15 pound maxima. I have 20 inches of cider, and then I put the grain, and then I do, four to five feet of either anywhere from OX to 4X tippet. And in the winter, when your hands are really cold, doing a straight mono rig, like a 25 foot leader, it's really a drag, even if you're wearing gloves. And you ladies know to get those uh, nitro gloves to wear in the winter. Mm -hmm. They keep your hands dry. Um, and so this way you get to handle fly line, and granted, what I have is just some old running line that I chopped off the fly line. I got probably 30 feet of it on the line. Um, and yeah, so that works really well in the winter. So I like to do that. Again, it's all about experimentation. I just keep saying, you know, the book is not written. Uh, jig it, dead drift it, you know, swing, swing it. Treat a streamer like it's just a nymph and let it go dead uh, over and across and strip. I mean, we, like I keep saying, I'm a broken record. The book is not written, and the fish will tell you if you're doing it right and you ain't catching anything. Well, you're either doing it wrong or they're not hungry. The Boise River, now it's down at about 228, which is low even for winter. 
But on a day like today when it's cloudy, the bigger fish, especially the browns, feel more comfortable. They don't, not worried about avian predators. And they're very aggressive right now because they're coming into the spawn and any smaller fish that are too close to the red, they're gonna try to chase out of there, which means you have an opportunity to uh, catch them. So again, this crummy weather, if you can get out, can be really good. Um, we have uh, friends who died on the river, um, uh, Colt and Martha Mottaway, and Colt floats the river, and the size of the browns that he catches between Barber Park and uh, Ann Morrison, you know, six, seven, eight pounders. And now he doesn't do it every trip, but maybe he'll catch two today, nothing for two days, then catch one. It, it's just makes me crazy. And he's uh, throwing streamers, trying different stuff. And Martha is a great Euro uh, nymphur. They both guide, but they know what they're doing and they do well. Okay. Martha uh, Modewell, I think it is. I can give you her number, mm -hmm. but Martha's pretty cool. So, when fighting big fish, you try to use angles and side pressure. This Devin Olson YouTube video, Five Steps to Landing Fish, it's great. And this whole idea of hooking the fish, if you try to look like the Orvis catalogs, like this, you're going to lose the fish. You want it low to the water and hopefully upstream of the fish, make him fight you and the current. Um, and uh, but that's a great video on how to fight fish and the angles. So if you figure out those angles and you're lucky enough to go to Florida for tarpon, all of a sudden the guy will tell you, okay, don't hold your rod tip up. You want to do these angles to put side pressure on the fish. And I go, wow, I kind of know how to do that. Uh, common mistakes, wrong size bead on the fly, uh, especially in this thinner water now, you shouldn't need the great big super heavy line, 4, 4.6. Uh, setting the hook, always set it downstream. I see people pull it this way and they're basically pulling it out of their mouth, you know, unless they're setting upstream, not using side pressure. Be the heron when you try to walk through the water. Try to sneak out there and be a little bit cool. Um, and again, this time of year we talked about until we get that first super cold snap with the crappy inversions, uh, the water temperature in the Boise typically doesn't get that cold. And typically for me, Christmas week is a day when you can catch a lot of fish every day. I mean, it used to be with my job. That's when I could finally get off. Um, so yeah, and again, holding your rod too high, it's just so hard to fish that way all day. And if you watch the guys in the videos, they don't do that all the time. You just can't. Okay. Yeah. So uh, the whole idea of, like I like to have my heavy fly on the bottom and the tag fly will be a <coughs> lighter, so I'm working two different parts of the water column, which can tell you maybe where they are. But a lot of guys prefer the heavy fly, which act as like an attractor and a lightning behind it. Again, it's a lot of this gets to personal preference. You have two guys on the American competition team who both do very well doing it just opposite of each other, yet. They both seem to catch a hell of a lot of fish, so uh, that can work. And again, it's evolving every day. New materials, new leaders, new flies. Yeah, some, again, don't be afraid to push the envelope. When people, when I told folks what I was doing, putting a dry fly line on, using it for still water, uh, throwing streamers. Uh, I have, um, on one of these Euro rods, I put a weight forward scent tip and I threw some of those articulated streamers from Kelly Gallup, a little awkward, but I still caught fish on them, you know, and people are going, well, you can't do that. Well, why can't I? I don't want to take two rods down to the river. I can just take an extra spool, take an extra reel, and, you know, it allows me to be annoying to my friends that just fish dry flies, so there's, there's a value to that. But again, the book isn't written. You, sh you should feel free to try 
whatever works for you. And if you find something that works, you know, keep doing it. Um, next summer, the Copper Basin is a great place to learn how to do it. The East Fork of the Big Loss, mm -hmm. the uh, North Fork of the Big Loss can be really good, and plus it's pretty and you can camp up there. Uh, the main stem of the Big Loss doesn't get really good until about August, and you can hopper dropper there. Uh, the Oahe, I've heard people say you can't hear all over there. Yeah, you can. I mean, I don't know why you couldn't. Um, so, yeah, it, it just works. So, any other questions? Oh, we have some resources here. I really like Devin Olson in practical fly fishing, partially because he has uh, helped out my cancer group, just did a program for us to do wood. Uh, fly fish food, they're good, except sometimes I think when they have too much material, they say, God, look, why did we buy all this crap? Lance, make them a fly with that. <laughs> and then they'll, you know what I mean? They, they push it. Uh, and they're, they're very good marketers. If you click on something just to see if they have it, you get an email for the next few days. Did you leave something in your cart? Very, very annoying. George Daniel, he's really good. Um, I like his flies. Trout Bitten, uh, which is uh, Dominic Swankowski. And then, of course, YouTube is just loaded with people. You, that, you can watch so much. There's old Dominion Trout Song. He has good stuff. A lot of what he does is sort of a rehash of some uh, tactical fly fisher, but it's sometimes you hear it from a different voice and a different angle. It really works. But those are good resources. Um, uh, Dominic got mad at me. He was doing a thing on mousing, and I said, have you ever thought of, you, he just, he's in Pennsylvania. I said, have you ever thought of asking anybody out west? And I got real facetious. Oh, I forgot. You really pretty much know everything, <laughs> don't you? Why would you ask anybody out west? Oh, my God. He wrote me an email, said, well, just stop watching me. And I'm going, wow, you're really sensitive, dude. You know, and then that just spiraled, you know. But he has some good articles. He is, though... Again, he's gone down the rabbit hole very far, but he has some good information. All those people are really pretty good. Uh, and again, I kind of like Devin or best, so. And so what questions? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> okay, so I see that most of your reels are a smaller arbor as opposed, opposed to a larger arbor. Is that personal preference? Is it just how they happen to balance on your rods or? The Euro, the only dedicated real Euro reel I have is this, uh, come on Christopher, it's a Galvin, and it's made for Euro, it's got a closed cage so the leader won't get out wrapped around, and it's just expensive, so, but it matches really, balances really well on this. The other ones, I've got my old hardy lightweights, because I haven't, I wanted to put some reels on these tonight, and, but, but like in the winter, with my George Daniel pattern, my old hardy lightweight does fine. Uh, but uh, again, if you can afford it, the Euro wheels are really nice. Uh, I believe that uh, everybody is coming out with them now. I think Lamson will come out with one, and they're local. And, um, so yeah, does that answer your question? Okay. Question. Yes. So can you give some tips to the gals here tonight that don't have Euro rods, right. that want to just experiment with it using their, sure. their, their Lincoln rods. If you're gonna use your own your own regular rod, uh, either make or get yourself a Euro leader uh, and try it. It's just gonna be a little harder task, uh, but a Euro leader will have a tippet ring on it and it will have sighted material so you can get the idea of what that's all about. And yeah, that's so many guys have started that Dominic who has trout bitten for years, he used an eight and a half foot five weight because when he started, now he's sponsored by everybody in the world, but when he started, he didn't have sponsors, so he just used what he had. And so yeah, that's a great way to start. I mean, um, and the other thing is that, you know, if you really decide you want to do it, um, I'm sure that, you know, your local fly shop would say, hey, you can try this stick for a day and see what you think about it. And it's truly, uh, 
I mean, I've had these people come in the shop and just say, well, I'm used to real quality stuff. And they go right to the top of the line. I go, God, you've never even done this. Are you, <laughs> you have a different checkbook than I have. You know? <laughs> so I started with uh, cheap rods. And, and even ones I have now, compared to what you can spend, I think these are 525, where there's a lot of people that are using the $1,100 blackouts. And I just, you know, and they're great, but I, you know, I have a hard time doing that in retirement. I'm not a pensioner. <laughs> so. You're a training post. I know you work at a flash shop, but I just got my Douglas DXF for $225, and it's a $500 rod. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, it's just great. Good I've been fishing the clear water that you sold me for yeah. like three or four years now. It's great. Oh, I have a clear water. I have a, a uh, what is it? It's a 10 foot. Uh, yeah, 10 3, it's great. I've got a couple uh, of the Orbis ones. Uh, I'm just sort of a rod slut, so I, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I've just been doing this a long time. Yes, ma'am. All right. Can, okay, sorry. Oh. Can, can you use a Euro rod in a float tube? Yeah, absolutely. It's so okay, much easier. Even though they're, they're just so long? Yeah, because you have that extra length, so it casts better. Oh. And it's just, you know, you're using a long leader, so when you bring it back in to net it, you know, you may need a, need a little longer handle on your net, but I do that all the time. Yeah. Good. So. So for the most part, you've got 20 to 25 feet of leader. Yep. So part of it is on, it's down in your guides, right? right? A good part of it is sure. in your guides. You're not really using that much of your line right. most of the time. Yeah. So how far are you cast, how far can you effectively cast out from where you're standing? Um, with this kind of a setup? You can at least do 30, 30 feet. Okay, so if you have 30 yeah. feet you're casting out and you're going to have 10 of it. So you might have, you have a 25 foot leader mm -hmm. uh, and then some tippet. You're basically casting almost all tippet. You'll get some fly line out of the rod. Mm -hmm. um, and there aren't that many places where you have to cast that far. Um, if you're working the shoreline in a belly boat, Casting and stripping, I'd put on a floating line or a sink tip line anyway. Um, but if you're fishing piranomids, where most of the time you don't need to cast for distance, you're just plunking it out there. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, you, I don't know. For most of the rivers we fish, like in town, the Owyhee, uh, even the Henry's Fork, you just casting the leader worked fine. Now I do, did say last year when I fished the Henry's Fork, I put a weight forward four weight line on it and I fished an indicator. And it's funny that river is so shallow. I had a thread Frenchie and a Frenchie that were maybe that far under the strike indicator. And with a weight forward four weight line, oh my goodness, you could cast it as far as you wanted to. But even up there, you don't you're not casting too, too far. And then when you need to mend your dry line, fishing dry flies, got that longer line or longer rod, it's, it's much easier to mend. So. So yeah. are, there, are there situations where um, the indicator mincing would be better? Or, I don't know, this almost just seems like a no brainer. Like, <laughs> Like why are why isn't this more popular? Maybe it is. I don't. I'm curious. Like, how many of you guys in your other one? Yeah. <laughs> Good question. Most I think fly fishermen are kind of hidebound. They really like what they like. Um, that buddy who I go with, he likes his uh, Winston rod. And I go, have you tried this on the Euro rod? Just cast it. I don't need to. I have this Winston. There's no reason for me to do that. You know. Well, you can have your mind open, you know. I, the way I, one of the things I like about fly fishing is there's always something to learn if you want. And I like to, again, I just like to see what's out there. And maybe I'll go down a road that, hmm, boy, that did not work at all. Don't try that again. Um, but it's just been fun to try different stuff. Uh, I think what I've really come to like about this is the versatility that I don't need to take my five weight to the river with me if I want to fish dries. I mean, I can just put a dry line on this and that 
ten foot two way for the weight forward uh, floating line. Oh my goodness, it's just a great bar. So when you switch to that, like a t uh, you know, um, the four weight line, mm -hmm. you have it on a different, different wheel, spool, different, different spool. Either one. So and are you weight? So is it match? I mean, obviously the the lines are matched to your wheel. So everything right. is up two steps. Oh, that's the other thing is that if you get a ten foot two weight and you want to, and you're not going to put a floating line on it. You still don't get a two weight reel or it won't balance. You tend to do bigger reels like uh, I this old Hardy lightweight. Put it on a, and it balances pretty okay, mm -hmm. just with a floating line. So I wouldn't use if you had a two weight reel, mm -hmm. you know, it'd be like that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So because you're buying a two or three weight rod, you don't get a reel that's teeny tiny. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Okay. But I was just saying, if you're if you're wanting to switch to a fly, uh, floating line, you go up two sizes from the weight of your rod. Right. So I have a ten and three, so I could go up to a five. Right. Five weight reel and line. Yep. Okay. And if you have a ten three that you set up for euro, mm -hmm. if you have a, typically a small three weight reel. That's probably not going to balance just right. It's not a three weight, like a um, four or five, something like that. Yeah, yeah. So typically, you, you're having a bigger reel, mm -hmm. even if you just have a euro yeah. uh, so, beater on it. Okay. okay. Isn't the rule of thumb to on reels to go up two sizes from whatever your rod is anyway? So if you have a two, you go to a four. If you have a three, you go to a five weight. Yeah, and you got to play around and balance, make sure that yeah. it's going to do it right. But typically, yeah, a on this 10 foot two weight, if you put a two weight reel on there, it'd be terrible. Yeah. yeah. Well, then everybody yeah. could try this. Yeah, yeah, really. Yeah. Uh, and what you can start with is just maybe you have already, just try the fly, Frenchies, thread Frenchies, Duracells, and then these jig streamers, especially on the Boise River and the Oahe. Uh, white or the sculpt snatch, and you can see all the different kinds of sculpting patterns. I tied a couple of these with these tiny little sculpting heads, mm -hmm. and I caught fish on it, but I don't really use it. I just, I don't know, that big metal head, I don't, doesn't work for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And why a big bead would, and I've tied some of these huge. Uh, George Daniel, who I stole the sculpt snatch pattern from, he ties a monster. And it must be that back in Pennsylvania, in his yeah. rivers, they tend to have bigger sculpting, or at least he's going for big browns with mm -hmm. bigger flies, you know, big fly, big fish type thing. It is 10 till 9, and the lights go off at 9. Okay. <laughs> so we have to wrap it up. Okay, any other questions? Uh, you can email me or you can call me. Um, do you have my... I can, yeah. that you can put on your website. Yes, will. Thank you. <laughs> so a few years ago, I uh, I decided I'd start tying custom tying for people. So my first order uh, was for this doctor from South America, and he stiffed me. Really? Yeah. And so. Uh, I walked in, I'm in this restaurant in Medellin, Colombia, which is a beautiful town. By the way, Colombia is such a great place. Uh, I'm sitting in this restaurant, the guy walks in and he looks at me like he knows me. <laughs> and he said, Juan Daniel, he looks at me, yeah, where's my effing money? <laughs> oh, I'm Chris, Chris, I'm sorry, I got this. I've been so busy, I, I'm sure you have. And we got it all settled up. <laughs> but if you'll see on my business card, it says Adventure Flies. I thought I needed 